So this week we're looking at the area of skills and competences or competencies. Sometimes it's written with an IES. I don't really know why, but I'll be saying competences, okay? And these are not two separate things. You'll see that skills are seen as being part of competences, but first let's explain how this fits in. There's an ideal world of cogs within cogs here where before rushing in and doing your classroom activities, which we did, you have to think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. You do your needs analysis. You've got this group of people who want to go there and we're going to help them get there. After that, from the needs, you then figure out what competences and skills are required to get them there. What will they need when they're there, all right? And that's an intermediary step because after that, we'll see next week, next week after Easter, that you have to write learning objectives or learning outcomes for the particular uh, lesson or, or um, the subject or course that you're involved in. So they can be on those different levels, okay? Lesson plan, subject curriculum. I'm using the, the Melbourne technology here, okay? Uh, the course would be, for example, the Master of Applied Linguistics. The subject would be this one, teaching, translation, and interpreting. And the class would be this one, the class on. So, uh, and I have to have an idea of what I'm trying to achieve in that class to give you the ability to do something, okay? Now, let me deal first with competence as a term. Why? Because it's a bit of a mess and it's not a term I like very much as you will see. Why is it a mess? Well, first of all, in, uh, in straight linguistics, generative transformational linguistics back in the early days, Chomsky, had uh, a definition of competence as the language system, uh, the system that's in your brain, as opposed to performance, which is when you speak, okay? That's rather like saussure, doing long and parole, if you know about the history of linguistics. Now, that's a very clear definition of competence. The problem is that educationalists, education theory, has not used that definition. Okay, uh, and uh, the history of thought and education really goes back to um, a terminology of skills and skills were there way before competence came in. Skills were what people talked about in the 1920s and 1930s, for example. Uh, skill is just the ability to carry out the task with determined results, okay, I am able to tie up my shoelaces, all right, for example. Uh, and I can do it quickly <laughs> without undue, uh, undue problems. Uh, you, how do you translate skill into Chinese? Is there a clear term for yeah. it? Yes. So we normally translate skills uh, into, uh, like, as a jinnang. So it's kind of like, um, what people train in the vocational training. So mm -hmm. in that sector, so very practical skills. And yeah. we also have a term for the uh, like kind of corresponding term for competence, uh, which is uh, non li. So it's um, not that <laughs> practical, it's kind of the ability um, to do something. So it's, um, but not necessarily the practical skills. It okay. could be more general. So yeah, we have the corresponding two words yeah. for skills okay. and competence. That's good. The important thing is that skill is the ability to carry out a task. It's, it's, it's really hands-on, you can do it. Yeah. Um, although back in the day, people would talk about critical thinking as a skill or uh, when I was doing literary studies, um, a, a practical explanation of a text would be a skill that you can do. So it's not necessarily manual in that sense. It can also be mm -hmm. intellectual skills, okay? Yeah. Now, uh, 
we find these days, I'm moving forward here to the European Masters uh, in Translation, in 2017, they have this model here, where you can't see because my talking head is there, I'll put me over there. Um, skills, competence, knowledge, learning outcomes, and they're defining these terms in different ways. Now, skill means knowing how, okay? I know I can, how to do this. I can tie up my shoelaces. I can put an S on the third person singular of the verb in English. Whereas knowledge is knowing that. Uh, Aristotle would have said knowing why, but knowing that is good enough, okay? The uh, proven ability to use knowledge, skills, and personal or methodological abilities, okay? So I know that. I know that. I know the grammar. Uh, third person singular, you add an S, all right? I can do it, and I know why I can do it. And then the third part of that is uh, aptitude, personal virtues, okay? And... Uh, those things are actually not here, I think. No, it's, it's part of that. So competence involves skills and knowledge and aptitude traditionally. Even though you've divided up the brain into four different things there, they're not. Skills are seen as being part of competence. And now I'm going to cover over that. So competence, what is it? Skills, knowledge, and aptitude, sometimes called abilities. But aptitude is better. Why do we do, do we have that change? But from skills as doing something to competence, I think it's because people started to see the role of education as being more than getting you to be able to do things. Mm -hmm. uh, we realize, especially these days, you could learn everything that you have to learn uh, watching YouTube videos or formally reading books, even about translation, even about applied linguistics. You know, don't, you don't have to come to class. You don't need an education institution in order to learn the skills that you're going to get. Um, the education institution uh, gives you thinking about why these skills work and how they can be improved. So there's an element of research involved in developing knowledge. And so we started to see a university education, especially as not just giving you skills, but giving you the knowledge that supports the skills. This was Aristotle who said, it's not important to know uh, uh, what to do, you have to know why to do it. And we would add when, etc. okay. And then the other thing is aptitude. There's a lot of insistence and I'm really talking about work done in the 60s and 70s, rethinking education, about why people come into an education institution. Um, it's also they learn to communicate and learn to socialize and learn to enter a community of uh, people who have a certain um, professional aspect on what they do. So uh, we, we find that, that kids go to school to learn how to become citizens, for example, to, to learn how to be part of a society, to learn to negotiate with other students, also to negotiate with the hierarchical power structures that are in the institution. So we come to see education as not just being give, uh, a way of giving you skills to know how to do things, we have to do that, but giving you these knowledge and aptitudes as well. Uh, in the history of education, that, that step is quite interesting because we had, back in the 60s and 70s in higher education, a distinction between polytechnics, which would give you the skills, you know, how to become an electrician, how to become a plumber, uh, but also how to become an engineer, and then the university, which would not give you practical skills, it would just give you the knowledge and the, and the uh, communicative abilities. Uh, since then, in the 80s and 90s, that distinction has disappeared and we're all together. So in the University of Melbourne, traditionally a research university based on knowledge and aptitude, we do have a Master of Translation, which gives you skills. Did something like that happen in China, you? Um, 
Yeah. So um, we used to have also like polytechnics uh, in China. Yeah. Um, uh, called uh, Ji Xiao. And we also have uh, universities um, and college. So like several different things for different purposes. Uh, but nowadays the boundaries are blurred. So um, in the university, you can also learn <laughs> translation, the very practical skills. Um, at the same time, you can also um, get a degree on very research oriented um, discipline. Yeah. Another, yeah. yeah. No, it's just what I, I saw looking at the history of the terms. I mean, why did competence come in? In theory, it was to put it all together to say that when a person can do something and they do it well, they do know why and they do know the knowledge behind it and they can talk about it and communicate it, which is, which is very important. Now, since competence, uh, which is really a term of the 80s and 90s, people in education theory have moved on to other things like literacy, which is one that interests me a lot. Literacy means we give you the tools and you then make decisions. Okay. I know how to read, but what you read and, and, and what you do with that ability to read is your concern. Uh, health literacy. I know how to understand what my doctor tells me and I can then make decisions about my body. Okay or people are working on uh, translation literacy, explaining to clients what translation is and how to work with a translator. Okay, so literacy has become a big term. And then capacity and capability are also terms that we find out there. Increasingly aware that we give people the basic ability to then go on and do things themselves, because we now know that uh, learning is a lifelong activity. And it's not like you've learned this at school or university and now you can go out and do it. No, you go to, we, we give you the capacity or the capability to keep on learning uh, as you go through your life. People in applied linguistics, have you come across these terms in your studies? Do we have anybody from applied linguistics there? No, okay. It's particularly Paul Gruber, uh, professor in applied linguistics, who, who insists we've moved on, he says, to, to capacity and capability, and that um, uh, the talk about skills and competence is old, okay? Now, in language, the traditional skills were speaking, listening, writing, reading, okay? Those were the four skills that, that you do with language, and these days, I would like to add translating, but that's a different argument. I'm not going to go into there now. They went out of fashion because they were associated with what's called deficit pedagogy, which means that you only teach people things because they can't do them. And so you make them feel bad, like this poor little girl there in kindergarten who's embarrassed. So. We're telling people, you have to learn what you can't do and you are bad and therefore you have to learn this thing, okay? Uh, often in order to avoid punishment and ridicule. So the skill to do something was not set, put in a set of ideas about uh, developing the whole person to get into a particular place in society. It was more like, if you can't tie your shoelaces up in 10 seconds, you're not good enough for this kindergarten for example. Okay. Uh, competence, on the other hand, is associated with a holistic view of complex activities. So competence is trying to educate the whole person, not just uh, tying up shoelaces, but uh, knowing how to look good and feel good about looking good, for example. All right. So that, that was positive. Now, What's interesting is that in translation studies, which is what I'm going to look at for the next few slides, we really got stuck with competence. Uh, we came in in the 70s and 80s. We knew there was something beyond skills that we had to look at, uh, but we, we haven't, we're, we're still talking about competence. We haven't gone on to these other things like literacy, capability, capacity. I'll just go very quickly. This is in German, a guy called Wils, you've got him here. 
he had a very simple model of translation competence. He said, well, you've got L1, speaking, listening, all those things, L2, da, 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 da. So you've got bilingual skills. And he says, well, translators can put them all together and coordinate them. And so there's a super competence, which is really basically adding L1 skills, L2 skills, and coordinating them. Very simple model, okay? Uh, in 89, though, he's talking about skills, Fertigkeiten in Germany. And then later on, he talks about proficiency, which is a different thing. And then in that same school, Lerscher later on was talking about strategies. Hannah Risku talks about expertise. Uh, Shefna Adab talk about performance ability as being uh, their, their, their sense of competence. I'm just trying to indicate that the terms were unstable although performance ability is the way Shefna and Adab describe competence. And all of these have been associated with that term competence. But people don't really know how competence relates to skills. There's, there's been a whole lot of different ideas about it. The more successful view of, um, I have to put my head down here, of translation competence has been multi-componential. I just put I-A-L there these days. So this guy, Neubert, uh, later on in 1994, said, well, we've got the language competence, the stuff that Vils was talking about, the previous guy, plus we have to know something about the area of activity. So if I'm translating uh, something in the area of medicine, I have to know something about medicine. Plus, I have to have communication skills to be able to get from L1 to L2. So he started to build it up and saying, look, it's not just a language thing, like Bill said, it's area knowledge and it's some kind of strategic communication uh, capacity. Okay, that was Neubert. These guys, Hatim and Mason, you might have heard of because they're known in Chinese translation studies. That's Basil Hatim in his younger days, okay. Uh, they had a similar model. They had, well, you've got to be able to process the ST, then you've got to be able to transfer it across, and then you've got to be able to process the TT. And a lot of their work was on text linguistics. So they were talking about text analytical skills and text composition skills. The people in Spain though, 1996, really went further with it. Okay, so this is Amparo Hurtado in Spain, and this is the basis of what became the Pacte novel. She said, well, it's language, it's extra linguistic, so the engineering or medical stuff, if you're doing a medical translation, plus the textual stuff from Hatim and Mason, plus you have to be a professional, okay, and know how to act like a professional and get money and write invoices, Plus, you need the capacity to go from L1 to L2 and, and, and transfer knowledge, all right? So we're building up a, a model of what translation is that's sort of additional. We're adding things on all the time. Uh, Marisa Presas here is actually from Barcelona, like uh, Amparo Hurtado, adds, you've got to know how to use dictionaries. You got to know how to find knowledge, documentation, Google stuff, we would say these days. You know, the area knowledge, you have to know how to use instructions and you have to know technology to translate. And then later on, one year later, she adds, oh, and you have to be able to remember stuff and you've got to be good at code switching, which means working between the languages as, as, as an intellectual capacity. And you have to be able to block out interference from the L1. You think, well, wow, this is, you know, it started off really simple, just L1, L2, and a bit of mapping operation. And now we need all these things. And then Roberto Mayoral, also in Spain, said, oh, and you know what else? You need common sense and you have to be interested in the world. That was what he means by curiosity. You have to be, have an inquiring mind. And you have to be able to communicate, yeah. Self-criticism, efficacy, we would say these days in educational parlance. 
and be meticulous and synthesize lots of information. I mean, ah. uh, you can see the, the development of this notion of multi-componential competence uh, grew and grew and grew. And there's no reason why it can't stop growing. And often the way they grow, and this is my point, is people observe among students translating that they make mistakes or they're unable to do things and they convert that into a component that has to go into the, the competence model. Okay, so if some student just uh, is not inquiring about the world enough to, to question a particular term, oh, they could do better, let's put that into the model. So what interests me particularly is that the way these models developed was based on deficit education, deficit pedagogy, observing what people can't do, assuming they should do it, and then you put it into the model. We then get to PACTE, uh, which is actually pronounced PACTE because it's actually Catalan. And this is the model that um, is most cited in translation studies. Uh, the Catalan means process of acquisition of translatorial competence and evaluation. Uh, led by Amparo Hurtado, who you saw on the previous slide. This is the very simple model, but under each of these, there's a whole list of things that people should be able to do. So going back to Vils, you're bilingual and you've got the extra linguistic knowledge, engineering, medicine, etc. You are able to move language from one side to the other and you can use technologies in instrumental. You know about translation because you're at a university, you get some theory and ideas. Uh, this is your personality over here. You're able to meet deadlines and, and explain things to people. And then because it's so complex, you have a thing in the middle which has to exist. Your strategic competence enables you to coordinate all the other things. Okay, so you get a very, very uh, complex model here. Uh, if you go into underneath, underneath each one, there's a whole list of things uh, which is coordinated um, in a peculiar way uh, because they had to invent this one there. Okay. Now, I don't really like that, but it has been very successful. It can be compared with uh, other approaches. Don Kirali, whom we've mentioned a bit, uh, sees translated competence in quite different terms. He emphasizes the human aspect of it, and he says it's a matter of joining communities. Uh, the educated users of several languages, you're joining the community of speakers over there. Uh, those conversant in specialized technical fields, you're joining the community of engineering or the community of, of medicine. Uh, uses of traditional tools and new technologies, you, 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 you use uh, translation memory software or you use machine translation, you join the community of computer users. So this is the same thing, but in, in more humanized terms, okay? Uh, becoming a translator means joining a whole lot of different communities and we might add joining the professional of joining the community of professional interlingual communication that is joining the profession of translators plus though we might add if you follow on this uh, view of, of multi-competential analysis. I think typing speed is really important if you're writing. Networking, making influential friends is incredibly important. Dressing very well is a big secret. I learned the better you dress, the better people like your translations. And my view of this model is that uh, there is no end to the list. Uh, and as the profession changes, particularly as technologies change, as we've seen with neural machine translation now, the multi-componential list of things will always be behind. And so I have not been very kind in my description of this kind of research. 
Another thing is that this is a sort of, um, oh, how can I put it? Um, it's a bit aleatory, it's a bit random. Uh, for example, the European masters of translation, masters in translation, had one model in 2003, which you can see here, which is interesting because it's got the same things as everybody else, but it's got translation service provision. It's got belonging to a company, a translation company in the middle, instead of that strategic place. And then that has become this 2017 model, which simply has a circle and you've got language and culture, translation, technology, personal and in interpersonal and service provision. Now, what's interesting when you go from one to the other, you, you've studied this. What's the difference between these two models? Um, so the main difference I can see is the translation service provision. Uh, it's not sitting at the center anymore. Yep. And it becomes one of the um, sub competence uh, in the taxonomy. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. And the other new area is personal and interpersonal. So they yeah. become aware that you have to develop communication a lot more. Anything else? I mean, I, I... Uh, and and they have translation competence. Yes, yes, yes. In the, the new model, to, they forgot to put translation in this one over here. And all the other things, everything else is there, but yeah. they forgot to put in translation. Okay. Yeah. And then things like in information mining has been integrated into technology, I guess so. Yeah. But, but it was, a, I mean, you're thinking so much about the many different things and you forget about the basic thing, mm -hmm. right? So uh, bottom line, the point is that these models are only models and uh, they, um, there, there is no truth in them. None of them have been based on empirical research. None of them cite any empirical research. It's just people talking together around a table, okay? Which means that the categories are underdetermined by the evidence. I mean, you could have, you could have five different models that'll all be correct because there's no evidence on which we can base them. They are all based on consensus. I remember when that first EMT model was presented in Brussels, I was invited to speak there and I congratulated the five experts, one of whom was Dorothy Kelly, who wrote the textbook that we have. The other was Daniel Guadec, um, whom I've mentioned uh, several times. I congratulated them on agreeing among themselves. I said, consensus, it's great. There's no, there's no I said, there's no scientific evidence for this, but if you agree, that's good. Uh, they aim to serve a profession. Often, if you look at the terms of that EMT one and PACTA, they are thinking about producing a professional translation uh, or, in, or a translator or interpreter. The model is there, the competence are the competences you require to be a professional translator or interpreter. But you and I know that only about a third of the graduates actually become translators and interpreters. Mm. So I think you have to start rethinking those models in terms of what people actually do with the things that we teach them. Mm. Our training is serving much, much more than just one narrow profession. And I think that has to go back and, uh, and make us rethink those models. The models don't tell you how you get better at things. There's no developmental aspect. There's no sequencing saying, first you do this, then you do this, then you do this. It's just everything together. But you know, when we do activities and we put them in a, in, into a subject or into a course, we really have to think about sequencing and that's not there at all. And then there's, there's something that, that for me is the most important. Uh, they're all very good in the, in the developmental stage when you're developing the whole person to be wonderful and happy and rabbits and butterflies. But a lot of the training I've been doing is terminal degree. Like at the end of the master, you do the master and then you're out in the workplace. 
And in order to be in the workplace, you've got to be able to do certain things. And so I must admit that when I'm training in that particular situation, and I use training instead of educating, uh, I do look at errors and I do say skill is needed. You must correct that particular error there. You must get better at that and you must do it right now. Uh, so they don't sort of account for that import of error, of, of looking at deficiencies and plugging them up. They wanted to get away from that, but in terminal degree, which I mean, the one before you go out into the big wide world, um, there is a reason for thinking that way, as they did in the 1930s. And I just said, they can't be wrong. I can't say any of them are wrong. I just say, well, there are some problems with them. This is from Hughes Research, I think, is it? Did you um, so uh, I cited this uh, research in my confirmation presentation, but I no, didn't so I've use stolen that. it from you. <laughs> okay. Uh, when I'm talking about revisiting, I mean, I, I really don't want to use a multi confidential model at all, but I think um, I do have to think about skills. I want to go back to the smaller elements, being able to do things. Why? Because we see in this particular area, uh, machine translation has got much better. And we have to think about the skills, real, how to do things uh, that translators uh, can use and will have to use. So which skills are automation resistant, I think is a very, very important question for us now. And it's the, from that question that I go back and look at the, at the models. A very simple model here. Manual skills, things you do with your hands, uh, they tend to be replaced by machines, okay? And cognitive skills that are routine, like adding up, are also done by machines. Uh, if you want an automation resistant, that is in our area, machine translation skill resistant skills, one that's going to be valuable in our societies, it's cognitive and non-routine, okay? Now, a lot of the aspects of translation are still cognitive and non-routine, but many other aspects are going to be lost, okay? Now, I can only ask that kind of question and get that kind of answer if I'm focused on skills. From there, though, you can develop many things, okay? So, one answer I'm interested in over here, you see the personal and interpersonal has been developed. Now I'm not privy to why that was developed, but it is a response to, for example, machine translation. What can machine translation not do? What can automation not do? The personal and interpersonal dimension, talking with people, adapting a text, communicating beyond word replacement, those are all aspects that we have to emphasize as one response. The other is technology, which has maintained itself there. We have to know how to work with technology, but also at the time do the things that the technology does not do. So going into skills, we can come back uh, and look at the competence models and, uh, and see how they're changing and quite logically changing as well. I'll finish this presentation, almost finished, almost, with other ways of deciding what we should teach. Because, um, you know, getting experts around the table to agree is a nice thing, but it's not a very rational way of deciding what people need. Now, in research on translation, we have a lot of research which compares novice translators, that is students, with professional translators who are sometimes end of year terminal, uh, second year master's students, but anyway, we'll call them experienced or professionals. And this is summarized by Engle Dimitrova in this book here. And we can say that there is some evidence for the following. The more experienced the translator, the more they, and there's a whole list of things. Use paraphrase process large units, they think on the level of the text rather than the word or the phrase. Spend time reviewing, so reviewing is important. Uh, they look more at the translation than at the ST. 
They think top down from big to little rather than little to big. That is, they think about the text and its function before deciding how to translate isolated fragments. They have good knowledge of the world and rely on it more than they go around Googling or uh, using documentation. And they're able to express their own translation principles and they have developed their personal theories about translation, about why they do what they do. And when they make decisions, they incorporate the client into that decision-making process. That is, they can think about their professional position. We thought originally that the more you do something, the less you think about it, like when you ride a bike and you're experienced at riding a bike, you don't think, oh, now I have to push the pedals. Okay, or driving a car, it just happens itself. Very, very complex, but, but it becomes uh, uh, semi-automatized. All right, that's a, a common thing. We thought that translation would be like that. We find it's not. We find that some problems are uh, become sort of automatic or semi-automatic. Uh, but that um, professional translators will spend a long time on the non-routine problems. So for a novice, everything is problematic and they work hard on everything. For an expert, uh, the routine stuff is done very fast and then there's a big problem and they think more about the big problem, the non-routine problem, which means that professionals are not necessarily faster than non-professionals anyway. And um, the, with regard to attitudes, personal attitudes, they are realistic. They don't overstate their capacities. They have confidence in their own personal judgments and they can be self-critical. Now, if I were going to develop a competence model or just a list of skills, I would look at that, those things there and say, well, at terminal level, in master training level, those are the things that I would want my uh, tra trainees to be able to do because I find that the people who've done it already get better at these things. So there's a developmental aspect in it. And I would start rethinking it. However, if you look at it, it's rather fragmented. And so I personally prefer to talk about skills to go back to the notion of isolated skills that we get better at. Another empirically based view of this is uh, from a doctoral thesis by Anna Lafeber, and she works at the United Nations, and she did a survey of uh, the skills and knowledge types that were lacking among new recruits. So this is, like I said, deficit pedagogy, uh, looking at what people can't be good at. Uh, I can't do at the moment, I'm going to get better at. Uh, so we're looking at uh, new translators who go into the European Union system or the United Nations system. They are revised, because somebody revises their work for two years, so they learn how to translate within these institutions. And then this was a questionnaire of the revisers. So we just asked the revisers, I, I supervised, co-supervised the thesis, uh, so it was we, if you like, um, which of these things uh, are lacking? Which of, the, which of these things do you have to train your new recruits in? And what's interesting is that they more or less uh, coincide in the two institutions. And if you look at them, look at the United Nations here, they all concern, well, not all, most of them concern writing the translation well, writing well, writing well in your target language, uh, recast sentences in target language, capture the nuances. Okay, this here is an interpretation, work out the meaning of obscure passages, all right, uh, which is also over here, but most of it is the capacity to write well. So if you're training people to go into these kinds of jobs, what would you do? Teach them to write very well which is why I do correct your English in your essays, okay? What's interesting is that we thought, for example, that technology would be very important. 
uh, te technology has changed the profession. So our technology is required here. And we discover, no, we look at this evidence or we look at the previous evidence, no mention of technology. Why not? Because when you go into the United Nations or you go into the European Union, or perhaps you go into the system of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in China, I don't know, you learn the technology. They will teach you their in-house technology. You do not need it prior to getting into the job. Okay, so some things are way down there. So to summarize, I think that uh, the whole debate about competence is sort of random, aleatory, based on people agreeing among themselves. It's lacked a foundation in empirical research. There is empirical research there that we can use to rebuild some kind of model if we want it. And I would add in conclusion, I think it lost its way. It started to talk about too many things. My own proposal here published many years ago, 1991, is that translation is a skill. All the other things are fine. I'm not saying you don't need them. I'm just saying, look, what is the core of the translation skill? And I'm saying, well, you've got a problem in the ST. You mentally generate a series of different ways of translating it. Okay, this, this, this phrase here could be translated as this, 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 and this. And because I'm a good translator, I select one from that series and I do it quickly because speed is important and I feel good about it. I'm confident, I feel justified, and I have some ethical reason for doing that. And that for me is the core skill of translation. Uh, why? Because it concerns translation and nothing but translation. All the other things concern other communities. I'm interested in what is specific to this particular community, not necessarily professional community. It can be the social activity. And I can relate that to machine translation or, or to machine translation does the generating part really well, doesn't do the selection part so well we can help it do the selection part, okay? Um, and the ability to, to use this can connect with a certain aptitude, but I'm not going to go into that right here and now. Now, I think also that this is a particular skill. I used the term competence, but I would just stick with skill, I think here, um, that we can teach when we train translators but we can also teach it in any um, additional language class, any class that's moving between languages. We can train people to get better at this.